Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> How's everybody doing? All right, I got three goods over here. Can I get a better? Can I get a greater? Can I? All right. So good to see you all. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> so this will be the last time I see you until 2024. And, and so I, I uh, won't be here the next couple of weeks. And so I just bless you with a very Merry Christmas and a glorious New Year celebration. And so it's been an honor, you know, being with you the last several months and just getting to share and, and getting to know some of you more. And, and so I really love what the Lord is doing. And so I, those of you that were here last week, <clears throat> I was starting to get into another series, which was going to talk about what Jesus has accomplished and looking at all the prophetic pictures from Egypt to the promised land. And as I was sharing last week, I don't know if you remember, I, I kind of started touching a little bit on the incarnation about God becoming man. And I... And as I was sharing, I was, uh, you know, there's uh, sometimes I'll be sharing and kind of having a conversation with the Lord on something. And last week was one of those times where I'm sharing with you and I'm and I'm having this conversation with the Lord where I'm thinking <clears throat> I'm, I'm just sensing we really need to dive in to the incarnation more be, before we get into anything else. And I think it's like <clears throat> what's perfect timing, too, because. The Christmas holiday is the Christmas holiday season really is focused on the incarnation. The, the, the thing that I want to submit to you, though, is that we've reduced the incarnation uh, to, I, I think, to the bare minimum. And we haven't really seen what has the incarnation accomplished. And some of you are like, what do you mean by incarnation? Like, that's a, a fancy word. I'll explain some of this <clears throat> more. But I want to just start off by saying this. I, I believe that as we, as we begin to unpack the incarnation, which is God becoming man, there are so many deep and powerful implications of what that means for us. We've reduced it to a baby in a manger. And that's okay. We celebrate that. But how many of you know we, that Jesus' incarnation, in other words, God becoming man, is more than just a Christmas season, obviously. And it's more than just a doctrine. It's more than just, yeah, God became man. And I, I mean, to me, one of the things is why. Why, though? I mean, like, what, what was the whole point? I mean, God... Well, couldn't you just like, you know, just zap sin out of, out of humanity? Couldn't you just like do, you know, snap your fingers and something change? And why does it have to get to this point? And, and what's, what, what does this mean for us? And, you know, so these are questions that I I'd, I'd started asking years ago. <clears throat> and I will say this. Um, oh, Lord. I'm going to try to do this in one session. And... Uh, and get us out of here in time. Yes, help me, Lord. <laughs> uh, my reputation precedes me. So <laughs> I have been known to preach the eternal gospel. <laughs> um, let me say this. What is the incarnation? Let me start with this. The incarnation is the manifest decision of God. Okay, the, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit made a decision that one of them would become one of us. And it wasn't just, the incarnation is not just God coming into our realm. It's God inviting us into His. It's not just Jesus entering into our state. It's an invitation for humanity to experience the triune life of God. 
the fullness of life, <clears throat> the peace. How, how many know that <clears throat> in Jesus' uh, prayer in John 17, he says, Father, restore to me the glory that I had with you before the foundations of the earth. Right? Remember that prayer? Yeah. And so what we, what we understand is that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And we talk about the, we talk about the Trinity, right? But, but what does it really mean? What, what is, is it just three in one? And, you know, we try to use all these examples. Like it's, it's like, you know, steam, water, ice, right? All the same thing, just three different. We try to get all these. We try to understand the, the, the Trinity. Let me just say this. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit have forever existed in fellowship, communion, joy, delighting in one another. No competition, no jealousy. Holy Spirit's like, I wonder if the Father loves Jesus more than me. Jesus is wondering like, well, what's, what's going on with Holy Spirit? Why is, you know, there's, there's no, there's no question, there's no, uh, insecurity. There's no jealousy or competition. There, there is a, a... How many know that because God is love, the truest essence of love is self-giving? Right? So within the, within the Godhead, within the Trinity, is self-giving love. This is why the first revelation that God gives to man after the fall is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who gives because he's not a taker. He's not demanding. How many know God's not a narcissist? He's not insecure. How many know that when you worship and you're saying, oh, holy is the Lord. Oh, you're so great, Lord. How many know he's like, yes, please tell me more because sometimes I forget. He's not insecure. Those types of things are not for him to be reminded. It's for us to see his vastness, for us to see his greatness. But here's the thing I want you to realize is that forever God has existed in fellowship. He's never been isolated, never been alone, never been, you know, separated. Always in fellowship, always in communion, perfect love, joy, and peace, and all these things. The source of every goodness that we know, like peace, or joy, or hope, or faith, love, family, Connection, right? The very source of everything good that we know of and that we, we can experience flows from the essence of the Trinity. Are you with me? I know this is probably like a little deep <laughs> for Christmas message, but, um, but follow me here with this because it was one thing for God to exist in that. And it was so beautiful and so overflowing. The heart of God... See. How many know that love, how, many say, how would I say this? <clears throat> the only way that you can really experience true love is in the context of relationship. Right? Relationship is the context for love to manifest. You don't have relationship unless there's love. And, and, and a relationship is the overflow mm -hmm. of love. Mm -hmm. A marriage is an overflow of love. A family is an overflow of love. And so, why is it that when Jesus teaches the disciples to pray, He says, here's how you need to start, our Father. All right, Matthew 5. Why does He say, start with our Father, not with our Master, mm -hmm. our Creator, our Lord, right? Right? The sovereign one, the almighty one. Why, why does he say start with father? Because the heart of the father is family. And forever the family of God, God the father, God the son, in the spirit of love have, has existed. But here was where the incarnation came in. That throughout eternity there has been a decision within the Godhead. One of us will become humanity. Why? For what purpose? To extend what we experience all the time to humanity. 
and to invite humanity into what we exist in all the time. This is why Jesus says in the Gospels, like, my joy I give to you. My peace I give to you. My life, the life of God, I give to you. Why? Because what the language there is all of the overflow of the Trinity he wants to give to humanity. He wants to invite us in, okay? So, everybody with me so far? Have I lost you? Are we good? Leading a little bit of foundation here before we get into uh, this whole thing on the Trinity. So, I want to go to John chapter 1. What is the incarnation? It's the manifested decision of God, the decision of the Father, to become one of us, to include their circle of shared life with us and to invite us in, okay? <clears throat> John 1, verse 1, uh, very famous, very familiar passage here. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Uh, where it says the Word was with God, in the Greek, literally, it is face-to-face. -face. The Word was face-to-face -face with God. They were, this is... This is a language of communion, of intimacy, of fellowship, right? Verse 2, he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. Verse 4, in him was life. This is the life of the Trinity, friends, the life of the Godhead. And the life was the light of men. I want to drop down to verse 14. Here's what happens to the Word that was with God, the Word that was God. What happens, verse 14? And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Amen to that. Yeah. Powerful verse, my friends. We read verse 14 as, you know, we just kind of like, okay, and the Word became flesh, blah, blah, blah. No, 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 friends. There is so much to this. <clears throat> the incarnation is the eternal Word of God, Jesus, the eternal Word of God, entering human existence, entering our, our fall. All of the, the pain, the suffering, the the darkness, all the things that humanity had been experiencing, Jesus enters in. Okay? Now, let me, let me start with, with something here. Let me, let me say this. When, when Adam and Eve fall, right, it's not just a sin problem. There's also a death problem problem because what happens in the fall is that it wasn't only an action a sin action uh, you, you understand that God gave the earth to humanity right he says Adam right he's have dominion right rule reign all these things so the earth was given to humanity and then when when humanity falls when humanity buys into the lie a couple of things happen number one the the authority or that dominion is now handed over to the enemy. And that's why Jesus calls him the prince of this world in the Gospels. Does that make sense? Yes. Now, after the resurrection, he's no longer called the prince of this world. He's called the prince of air. Because he lost territory. Jesus took the territory back. Okay? But he can still lie, still try to deceive, but he has been removed from that position of, of rulership. All right? Not, not, but here's the other thing. It wasn't only a sin issue. There was a death issue now. Because what happens is because Adam and Eve have been given dominion and authority, Adam and Eve introduce a, a system, a governing system called death into the earth. And now they are experiencing death and decay Creation is experiencing death and decay. Everybody with me? 
It's an inferior governing system. But it's been governing humanity. Now, it's interesting, Paul says in 1 Corinthians, this is the way most of our translations say it. He says, all things will be placed under Jesus' feet, and the last enemy to be defeated is death. You ever read that verse? 1 Corinthians 15. And the last enemy to be defeated is death. And it sounds like something in the future, right? If you look up that passage in the Greek, it is not a future tense. It is present tense. Literally, it says, the last enemy being destroyed right now is death. And I believe there is a generation emerging that is going to catch that revelation. Where we will not submit to the things of death or sickness. Things that, I mean, listen, Moses, under an inferior covenant... The old covenant, an inferior covenant to what you and I have, lives for 120 years, climbing mountains, not needing glasses, not needing, here I am, right? Not needing, uh, you know, I'm just saying, I, I'm, I'm working on it. All right? I'm like, Lord, I need that revelation. 120, climbing mountains. 120, keeping up with, I mean, you remember when Caleb goes into the promised land? Caleb would be getting the senior citizen discount at Denny's very easily, friends. And he's, and he's like, he's like, listen, 40 years ago, I saw this land. And here I am today. I'm as strong a day as I was back then. Man, I want to say that. I want to say that when I'm 80. I'm as strong a day as I was in my 40s. You know? <laughs> What's that, that old song? I'm not as good as I once was, but I'm as good as I've ever been or something like that. I don't know. It's ridiculous. But anyway, the, the, the point is, is that there is, there's, there is life, resurrection life working in us. And we keep submitting ourselves to the inferior power of death. I believe we're going to, listen, everybody's been searching for the fountain of youth, right? Ageless stuff and whatever. And I think that there are solutions. I, I think there are things within the earth itself, whether it's herbs or plants or leaves or whatever, that are, that Holy Spirit will give us revelation that will reverse things that we have abused our bodies in, that will reverse uh, you know, the mind becoming foggy and, and memory lapse and all of that stuff. Friends, I, I, just, I just think the incarnation is more than what we have, we have thought. It's more. Does that make sense? Um, and so, <clears throat> so Adam introduces death, and we, become, we became slaves to death, right? We, it was death has been ruling and, and reigning. And but, but something happens. Here's the thing we have to understand. <clears throat> God gives man authority over the earth. Man forfeits that authority. It would have been unjust. Let's, let's use that word. It would have been unjust for God to go to the serpent and say, hey, you know, uh, Adam didn't mean it. He didn't know what he was doing. I'm going to go ahead and just take that back as God. I gave it to man. Man lost it. I'm going to take it back as God. How many of you know God would have been violating some principles there? So the solution, if man was given authority, if man lost it, if man introduced death, man would have to bring the solution. And thus, the son of man comes on the scene. Jesus has to come on the scene as humanity to, in one way, legally undo what Adam did. But even apart from that, or, or along with that, not only the legal aspect, but also the invitation for us to experience the circle of life. That sounds like Lion King, right? Uh, the circle of deity, okay? All right. Uh, the song's going off in my head now. I can't get it out. <laughs> But you hear, where, you hear where I'm going with this, right? You, you, this makes sense? <clears throat> the incarnation was God's emphatic no to the self-destruction of mankind. The incarnation is God saying no to death ruling over man. The incarnation is God's no to, to man's self-destructive choices. The incarnation is the very life of God intersecting our death, invading our, our lives, our existence with His life 
and His existence. Amen? Amen. So, I want to tell you the incarnation is more, and we celebrate this, don't get me wrong, but it's more than baby Jesus. Right? Dear baby Jesus, Ricky Bobby said, I think, in his prayer, his glorious prayer. Some of you don't know what that's about. Don't worry about it. It's an inside joke. Um, but, you know, the, the whole prayer uh, to, to Jesus, and, and we, we see this little baby in a manger, and we're thinking, oh, man, this is... But you, what you have to understand is that his birth became your birth. His life became your life. Let me ask you this, friends. Did Adam sin for you or did Adam sin as you? We'll get into this another time, but Romans 5 says that when Adam sinned, everyone sinned. Adam didn't just sin for you. Adam sinned as you. Why? Because we were all in the loins of Adam. Every person, every, we were all within Adam and Eve when they ate. Do you know that Hebrews actually talks about this? Hebrews says that the reason, you know, Hebrews is so powerful because it's comparing and contrasting uh, all the old covenant types and shadows that, that they trusted in to the new covenant of what Jesus did, right? And, and so for one example, how many know that the priesthood of the old covenant was the Levites, the Levitical priesthood. But how many know before there was a Levite, there was Melchizedek? And so the writer of Hebrews is saying that our priesthood in the New Covenant is not the Levites. It's not the Levitical priests that were in the tabernacle and the temple, you know, and all that. He says our priesthood is Melchizedek, who's not just a priest, but a priest and a king, right? And, and this is what's powerful. Here's how he proves it. This, this geeks me out. He's proving it this way. He says, when Abraham gave a tenth, gave a tithe to Melchizedek, he was showing that Melchizedek was greater than him. Right? Melchizedek was greater than Abraham because Abraham tithed. Because you tithe to the one who's greater. That's what he says in Hebrews. He says, and when, when Abraham tithed to Melchizedek, he said... Levi was in the loins of Abraham. Oh, my goodness. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, who's also Israel, and one of Israel's sons was Levi, which is where the Levitical priesthood comes from. He said when Abraham gave a tenth to Melchizedek, he said Levi was giving a tenth also, showing that priesthood is greater than us. Oh, my goodness. That geeks me out, friends. I don't know why. You know... <clears throat> In other words, what, Mel, what Abraham did, Levi was in his loins. Levi, the Levitical priest, tithed, gave homage, showed Melchizedek was greater. In the same way, when Adam acts upon this lie, you and I were included in his act. Adam represented all humanity. Now, one of the names of Jesus is he's the last Adam. He's also called the second Adam. If what Abraham, I mean, I'm sorry, if what Adam did affected all humanity, is it true also that what Jesus did affected all humanity? Oh, my goodness. If Adam didn't just sin for you, but as you, everything Jesus did, he didn't just do for you. For you, he did as you. Now, I know we, we preach so many times that Jesus died for your sin. True. But even greater, Jesus died to sin as you. Wait a minute. This is why Paul says in Romans, he says, consider yourself dead to sin. Wait, how? No, man. I mean, Paul... We're just a bunch of sinners saved by grace. That's not what Paul's preaching in Romans. He's saying, no, no, no. You died to sin. When did I die to sin? In Jesus. In the incarnation. When Jesus died, you died. When he was buried, you were buried. When he resurrected, you resurrected. 
When he was seated at the right hand of the Father, you were seated. That's why Paul says in Ephesians, you, you've been seated with Christ in heavenly places. You have every spiritual blessing, right, in heavenly places. How is that possible? Because Jesus' work in the incarnation was not just for humanity, it was as humanity. Now, how do you experience that? Well, Paul says, simple faith. Trust. Receive it. Right? I mean, <clears throat> you, you don't, it's not, there's not a formula to it. it it's, there's no works to it. You, you know, I, I think most people, most people know the condition they're in. Right? Most people know, man, I, I, and, and if they don't, Holy Spirit is working to help them see. You're in a condition that needs something greater than yourself to solve it. And there's already been a provision. Now receive what Jesus has done. And it begins to transform your existence. Amen? Amen. So, <clears throat> oh my goodness. Oh, Lord. Uh, <laughs> the Word made flesh. The Word made flesh, going back to John 1, tells us that Jesus, who is the Word, fully participated, fully participates in our human nature and our human existence. This is what Hebrews says, that he understands the things that you're going through. Right? That, that he can feel <clears throat> the, the, the things that you're experiencing. That's what Hebrews says, that we have a high priest who can empathize, who can feel our struggles, our our. our you know, the things that go through our mind. You have to understand this, friends. Okay, please, please get this. <clears throat> Jesus did not become a super elevated human. It says in Scripture that uh, Jesus actually came in the form of fallen humanity, right? Sinful flesh, fallen humanity. He does not come in like... You know, like, you know, you have Superman, right? Like he's a superhuman person, you know. Jesus was not operating as a superhuman. He comes in as human, fully human. And this was over the first 400 years of church history. This was a hotly debated topic of how do we describe Jesus, the incarnation, his godness, his humanity. How do we describe all of this? Because here's what we have to understand. Jesus has to be fully God, 100% fully God, in order to bring the life of God to us. But he also, at the same time, has to be fully 100% man in order to receive that life as us. Okay, did you get... It's, <clears throat> there is, this is important. It's not that his divinity swallowed up his humanity it's not at some type sometimes he's human sometimes he's god he does this as god he does this as hum <clears throat> everything jesus for 33 and a half years full full deity right full god and full humanity if that's not true none of this works for us if he's not fully god then he cannot extend the invitation of god if he's not fully man, then he cannot receive the invitation as us. Does that make sense? Oh, man. I'm going deep. <clears throat> How do I want to end this? So let's do this. <clears throat> the, the union of God and man in one person, Jesus Christ. This is the essence of the incarnation, right? God becoming man, but not ceasing to be God. Still 100% God. This union right here in him means that Jesus, the person of Jesus, is the living bond between God and man. In him is the living bond between God and man. So three things I'll tell you about this real quick. And this is all we'll get to. Three things real quick. <clears throat> what are some of the implications of the deity of Christ? Of, of 
the, the, the divine aspect of Jesus. I won't be able to get into the human aspect yet, but as fully God, the Son has always existed within the circle of deity. So here's what we know. Number one, there is an eternal communion of knowing and loving within the Godhead, right? This eternal communion that exist, existed. And only from within that communion, only from within the Trinity can God be known. It's the only way. The only way to know God is from within that circle of deity, that circle of the Trinity. That's number one. Number two, only Jesus knows that communion of the Father and the Spirit. No angel, no saint of old, uh, no, none of the living creatures. Nobody knows the communion of the Father and the Spirit like Jesus. Number three, only Jesus can extend that intimate knowing and communion to anyone outside the Trinity. I'll give you a verse on this. Matthew eleven twenty seven. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal Him. Did you get that? So because He is God, and he comes forth from the heart of God, whatever Jesus makes known about God is the final truth of what the Father is like. It's the final truth. We're not reading about God from the outside. We're not hearing someone's interpretation or someone's opinion of what the Father is like. This is why Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Whatever Jesus does, the Father does Jesus is not the good side of God uh, I think it was T.F. Torrance, Professor T.F. Torrance one of the greatest theologians of the 20th century said there is no other God behind the back of Jesus what you see is what you get that's why he says I only do what I see the Father do uh, <clears throat> the word and act of, of Jesus are identical to the Father so when Jesus says Father forgive them He's not asking the Father to do something that He's unwilling to do unless the Son prays it. No. He is actually expressing the heart of the Father. Because if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Does that make sense? Um, <clears throat> when, when Jesus uh, says to the woman caught in adultery, I don't accuse you. Right? He says, where are your accusers? She says, I don't have any. He says, I don't accuse you either. Go your way. And sin no more, right? What was he demonstrating? This is what the Father is like. Mercy, truth, grace, forgiveness. So the, the two sides of the incarnation that are one in one person, right? The human side, the divine side. On the divine side, the deity of Jesus is the guarantee that the revelation he brings us about the Father is true and it is from within the heart of the Father. So, oh man, I'm having to cut a lot of stuff and butcher a lot of stuff here. But let's let's uh, let's do this. Let me let me closing number two. And uh, is it making sense so far? Uh, when we talk about the human side, that'll that'll um, basically. It comes down to this. It comes down to that if you, when you understand the incarnation is more than a baby in a manger, that the incarnation is actually the cornerstone of the gospel. It is the cornerstone of, of our new life, of, of our inheritance, of our identity. <clears throat> because Jesus is representing both sides of the covenant, the side of God and the side of man. And where man was the one that was the weakest link in every covenant prior, there is no weak link in this new covenant. Because Jesus is representing our side. 
He represents the side of the Father revealing the Father to us. And he represents us revealing what we have received. You realize that <clears throat> it's not your faith that saved you, right? Paul says that, right? Paul even says that the, the faith that was necessary for your salvation was not of yourself. It was a gift of God. So really, it was the faith of God. I don't have a faith that I have generated in my own ability. I've actually been given a, a gift, which is God's faith. And I can cultivate that, right? I don't have to try and generate my... See, when you understand the incarnation, what you realize is that <clears throat> you are no longer bound to your capacity. In my capacity, there's some people I love more. And some people I have a real hard time with. <laughs> I know nobody else. That... It's just me. Pray for me. But here's the thing. Because Jesus has represented me, I died. I was buried. I was resurrected. And I'm no longer limited to my capacity for wisdom, my capacity for love, my capacity for forgiveness. This is why, in, because of the incarnation, I know my humanity is not mere humanity. There has been something exchanged where the humanity of Jesus is now the starting point for you and I. The only way to undo what Adam did is to kill that race. And so Jesus embodies the fallen race of Adam in himself as man, nails it to the cross, buries it, and then resurrects as a whole new creation. This is why Paul has a problem describing you in 2 Corinthians 5. He's like, we're new creatures, new creation, something unseen because of the incarnation. Jesus takes on sinful human existence and then buries it and raises righteous holy human existence and then says this is who you are and just as adam released death the last adam releases life life giver scripture says Does this making sense so here's what it basically would conclude with uh, because of the incarnation his birth is your new birth his death your death his life, your life. His joy, your joy. His abundance, your abundance. His peace, your peace. His victory, your victory. His relationship with the Father is now your relationship with the Father. Do you know that your worship is actually, how do I say this? We're not creating a worship outside of what exists. We're actually participating in the worship that has been going on for eternity. Does that make sense? Now, you have an individual voice in that. You have an individual D, you know, DNA and blueprint in that. But, but what I want you to see here is that, is that you are participating in the very life of God through the incarnation. Now, we could talk for about two or three hours on the incarnation we're like barely scratching the surface and I'm not doing a great job at it, but I want to tell you that this has become your existence. Okay? His mind is now your mind. His solutions are now your solutions. Amen? Amen. His capacity is now yours. And it's a limitless capacity. So, um, <clears throat> let's, let's, uh, let's stand together. I'm grateful that we are not limited to our ability to love, our ability to forgive. I'm not limited to my ability to see people in the natural. You have the capacity through the incarnation to see people the way He does. To have His eyes. To have His perspective. His hope. This is good news, my friends. <clears throat> The very life of God 
has been transferred to you and I through the incarnation. He has to be fully God for the fullness of God to come in. He has to be fully man for that fullness to reach us. Remember years ago, and I think there might have been a recent occurrence of this, years ago, I, I don't know if it was in Chile or where, there were these miners uh, that were stuck like far, far down mm -hmm. under the ground. And, and so, you know, they were down there. I forgot how many days it was or whatever. They were having such a hard time trying to, to get them out. I, I, I don't remember all the details to it. I just remember <clears throat> that at some point, someone from the surface had to be let down to get these guys and bring them back up, right? That's a very crude picture, but yet still a picture of what's happening in the incarnation. That the divine God has become one of us to reach down to where we were to bring us to where he exists. But he has to be able to reach us somehow. He has to become man in order for the transaction with death to be legal and for the transaction to free humanity to be correct. Does that make sense? That's why he's the last Adam. And so, <clears throat> I want to I just speak over us. I want to pray for us. <clears throat> hmm. Thank you, Lord. Uh, I do. I, I do feel. I have a prophetic word, um, and it's uh, it's for Tanya, right, Tanya? Uh, <clears throat> Tanya, I I was sitting in the back, and the Lord just began to minister to me about you, and I saw that you have a value for wholeness. You have a value for uh, holistic things, natural, holistic wholeness like that whole um, like there's a value in you for those things um, <clears throat> uh, and you have a value for the simplicity of life right to keep things simple and to be grateful uh, for the simple and I and I saw a dream in your heart to do something that would help people like that would help them to live better, um, body, like mental health, emotional health, like EQ, like emotional uh, intelligence, emotional health, and and even even where uh, like I believe that you are a person that will provide alternatives to what the traditions have said. Well, it's you just have to do it this way. These are the only, there's option A, option B. And you come in with a third option. And it's a third option that is, that is, not, uh, that is not the norm. It's actually spirit-inspired. And it's something that is, is from, from the very imagination of God. And there's, there's something in you that, uh, where I just see you wanting to produce things or wanting to provide things things for people who don't know that there are other options. Um, <clears throat> and the Lord began to minister to me about how you have you have had to learn victory over things that tried to uh, break you in your past. And, and so there were things that, that tried to, uh, you know, the Lord said, I heard this phrase, you are not damaged goods. And the things that try to damage you, uh, you actually carry an authority over. And so I just release to you that God is, is just setting your mind free from, from those things and that you're recognizing your victory uh, and your confidence in Him. And so, Father, I, I just thank you for the dreams that are within her and that they are going to manifest Lord, I just, say, I just say, Lord, that even in 2024, there will be demands 
for the dream that is inside of her and that it will come to flourishing, it will manifest, and Lord, that you will, you will cause for those things uh, to be a massive blessing to people. Um, <clears throat> I, I just feel like you're, you're, part, you're going to be part of a movement that is, that is bringing holistic things to people and, and the simplicity of life to people. Uh, you're going to be part of a movement in that. And so, so I just I bless you in the name of Jesus. I bless the dreams of God that are inside of you. And, and, I, and I just want to say thank you uh, that you didn't give up and that you didn't quit even when everything seemed to be against you. Uh, and, uh, yeah, thank you, Lord. <clears throat> wow, thank you, Jesus. Uh, you're, you're really going to have keys for emotional breakthrough in people's lives and mental breakthrough in people's lives. You're really going to have keys for them through what you've walked out and, and part of your own journey. Uh, Lord wants you to know you have an assignment against abuse. There's something in you uh, that is, uh, for lack of better words, like I just, you know, abuse. There's, there's a hatred towards that, for lack of better words, and I, and, but a love for that wholeness. And so I just say that you will bring people from brokenness to wholeness, from abuse to, to fullness, and, uh, and that they will recognize that they also are not damaged goods in Jesus' name. Yeah, amen, amen. And so, Father, I, I thank you for, uh, for your people. I thank you for the incarnation and that we have been redefined. <laughs> We've been redefined by the incarnation. And, and Lord, I, Holy Spirit, take this message further than what I could take it, uh, clarify it better than what I could, and, and, and cause it to, to sink deep into our lives. Um, uh, what's your name again, brother? I just went, Paul, right? Is Paul, can I hold your hand, Paul? Um, Father, I thank you for Paul and the calling that's upon his life. Paul, I just uh, release a grace upon you, the revelator grace, the revelator gift, a revelation of the Holy Spirit in Scripture, revelation of Holy Spirit into the things of the Spirit. And uh, Paul, there's a lot of different gifts uh, <clears throat> like so many things that you are good at, so many things that you can do well. Uh, I feel like you could go into almost any field and prosper. And you have an ability to think uh, clear. You have an ability to learn quick. You have an ability to bring things together. And, um, and while there is a grace work for you to, to do things and to, to work with your mind and to work with your hands and to, to, to prosper in so many different ways, there's also a call of God upon your life that is beginning to awaken more and more within you. And I, I just see the, it's almost like the voice of God inside of you becoming louder and clearer and the call of God upon you becoming more evident. And, and so there are some things that you've been uh, just kind of feeling direction and, and uh, man, I just feel a pull or a draw to this over here. And, and, um, and so, Paul, I just say that um, ministry is calling to you, and it will, it will operate in your life, and it will look different than the traditional uh, ministry. I, I just say that you will be a new breed of, of ministry, that you will be a, a new breed, a pioneer, a forerunner of things where you will have a grace for, uh, for ministry uh, aspect in the church, but also for business that will, that will produce income. You will have multiple, I just prophesy, multiple streams of income that will actually fuel and provide for the vision that you have uh, for the Lord will entrust you as a leader within the body of Christ. And, and you will have an anointing to break the limiting uh, mindsets where they have had limited capacity. You have an anointing to break that off of people. And to help them to think outside the box. And so I just, I bless you. Um, uh, I do see your feet on different nations uh, where you will travel to different places. 
uh, but you'll have a home base where you'll come back and, and you'll, you'll do the work of the Lord in the region and then you'll go out and then you'll come back. And, and, uh, but you will, the Lord is preparing you to be a leader of leaders. And, and, and so I just bless that in Jesus' name over your life. Yeah, amen. That revelator gifting upon you, my friend. Amen. That makes sense to you? Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you, Lord, for that. And so, ah, thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> Um, and I want to, I want to just honor you, my friend, uh, Robert. I just want, I want to honor you for the fruit of generations that have come from you, and and the the legacy that you have brought into the earth of your family, and of the way that you have, you have given of yourself to others, uh, friends, family, you know, people that you know, uh, because. The thing, you know, I love how Scripture says that um, the the real heritage is leaving a legacy to your children's children, right? And uh, and that's the definition of a good man, my friend. You're a good man. You're a good man, and uh, and so I bless you. Uh, and can I just hold your hand, sir? I, I I bless your health, and I Lord, I thank you for the sharpness uh, in his mind the sharpness in, in his thinking. And we just say, Lord, uh, just a, a re-energizing and, and a, uh, a touch from your hand upon him in a very significant way. Lord, I thank you that dreams uh, will come to him, that will give him ideas, and that will continue to, uh, to, to just reveal purpose and destiny. And so, Robert, I bless you, and I bless the generations that come from you, and, and the fact that you will see the goodness of God in the land of the living, and that, your, and that the seed that has come from you, the generations that have come from me, you will see their influence, and you will see their greatness in their purpose in Jesus' name. And so I just bless you. I just felt like I wanted to bless you and honor you, my friend. Amen. Bless you, brother. And so, Lord, I, I thank you uh, for, for the breakthrough in, in our lives, in our families, in this house. And, and I thank you, Lord, for uh, everything that you are preparing us for. Reveal purpose, assignments. Show us even more what Jesus has accomplished and what it means for us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, Amen my friends. Uh, bless somebody around you. And uh, yeah, let's give the Lord a thanks for today. And appreciate you all. I'll see you next year. All right. <laughs>
with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Okay, we've got a healing prayer ministry to my left, your right, if you would like to have prayer. And it is I and Paul and Sarah will be praying over you. <laughs> 